me uh, welcome everybody uh, to another session uh, with uh, Virtual Global Spine. I'm honored to uh, host, uh, along with my colleagues, uh, my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Volune. Uh, so Steve uh, trained at the University of Iowa with me uh, when I was a chief resident, and then uh, pursued a fellowship at Northwestern, and then took a job at uh, The Ohio State University Department of Neurosurgery, and where he's right now, uh, the director of, of Spine. He's an extremely talented uh, neurosurgeon, a spine surgeon, and I've operated with him so I can witness, I can attest to that firsthand. And um, he'll be speaking about surgical management of patients with ankylosing spondylitis, a pretty challenging population of patients uh, that may present with a variety of, of uh, pathologies, chin and chest deformities, their fractures, when they suffer fractures usually uh, um, challenging to treat. So I'm looking forward to this uh, talk for a long time. So welcome, uh, Dr. Volune, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nader, for that uh, very, very warm welcome. And again, it's uh, quite an honor to get a chance to talk to you, uh, to, to you guys about this topic. It's uh, 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 well, kind of a love-hate relationship, right, with these patients. Uh, uh, so near and dear to my heart, but also a lot of pain and anxiety with this stuff. So um, first off, uh, my conflict of interest, uh, nothing related to this talk. Uh, so just a brief introduction on ankylosing spondylitis. Um, it's a disease that affects about 0.9% uh, of the population worldwide. Uh, it's one of the more common seronegative spondyl arthropathies. The exact pathophysiology is, is not well understood, but we think that there are uh, genetic as well as environmental factors that seem to play a role. Uh, and symptoms typically start in the second, third decade of life. It typically occurs more commonly in males, uh, and it, it does vary uh, among ethnic groups. Uh, and I'm the, again, my, the goal here for me is not to have a didactic type course. So please, you guys ask, stop me, uh, you know, ask questions anytime uh, as we kind of go through. Uh, so with ankylosing spondylitis, there are both the extra articular diseases um, or, or manifestation of the disease, uh, usually anterior uveitis, uh, bowel disease, psoriasis, it can affect the heart. Um, and then the articular disease. So they typically present uh, with back pain. The, the typical um, presentation or is that early morning stiffness. They start to develop uh, SI joint type, uh, type pain is usually the early symptoms, uh, but it also affects the, the hips, the shoulders. Um, and then this, this process of the enthesitis, which is the, the inflammation you know, at, at the various uh, uh, joints. So in terms of the natural history, uh, this is variable. And actually, it's not really very well studied and understood. So there are some early uh, prospect prospective studies uh, that essentially found that the first typical 10 years of the disease will dictate uh, uh, generally how patients do. So if people have uh, fairly mild disease uh, during the first 10 years, they generally don't progress to severe spinal disease. Whereas on the other hand, if there's a, a, a more rapid progression of, of symptoms in that first decade, then they, they, they tend to get more um, significant uh, disease. Uh, and then there is some uh, evidence as well that uh, hip involvement um, seems to be a, a predictor of uh, severe spinal disease. So in terms of the effects uh, of ankylosing spondylitis on the spine, um, as the disease uh, progresses, uh, this results in ossification of the ligamentous attachments uh, of the spine. And there is uh, bony replacement at the junction of the annulus fibrosus of the disc cartilages uh, and the margins of the vertebral bone leading to uh, fusion of the adjacent uh, vertebra. Um, as this occurs, there's also some uh, B cell and T cell uh, or lymphocyte uh, infiltration, uh, which results in loss of the trabecular bone. So what you end up with is this typical pattern of, um, this is a CT scan from one of my patients, right? It shows pretty significant um, ossification and fusion. Um, and then you can see the, the, the loss of, of bone uh, more posteriorly in the vertebral body. So they're osteoporotic. It results in this 
uh, very brittle, brittle spine. Uh, and so how do these patients typically present to the spine surgeon? Um, really, it's, it's kind of three main things, right? So they're traumatic fractures, which uh, Nader alluded to uh, earlier, and that's probably what, what all of us are going to see at some point in time. Uh, and then they can also get uh, craniocervical junction problems. So as, they, as the spine fuses, uh, one of the later joints that gets affected is, is the occipital cervical joint. And so they start to get instability uh, at the craniocervical junction. Uh, and then lastly, um, as the disease uh, progresses, there's typically worsening spinal deformity. Um, and so sometimes patients uh, uh, present with that, either like a chin, as Nader mentioned, a chin on chest deformity um, or a flat back deformity with, with sagittal malalignment. And so I think at this point, I just want to, you know, I'll, I'll transition to start going through some cases. And then, like I said, you guys stop me, ask me questions, and, and we'll kind of go around. Okay, so this is the first case. Um, this is a 73-year-old man that came in uh, after a motor vehicle accident. Uh, on his physical exam, uh, he presented to our ER. He was intubated. Uh, his cranial nerves were, were intact. He was localizing on his physical exam. He was moving everything. He had a hemothorax. Uh, he had a chest tube in place. He had a broken wrist and uh, gets his pan scan and, and, and shows up with this. Um, any comments from the panel or? Absolutely. So let's start with uh, Dr. Dr. Gibbs. Um, uh, she's our uh, supreme neuroradiologist. Supreme. Thank you. Thank you, Nader. You know, like, when I saw this picture, um, the first thing I think about is this angulation of the spine right here. It's three column fracture, obviously. I'm, you've got to have, you know, at least um, hemorrhage in the canal, if not cord injury. I don't know how you couldn't have cord injury, although you're seeing, he, you know, he's pretty intact. How on the, he's on his back in the CT when these pictures are obtained, just so the audience all knows that if you haven't seen a person in CT. So I'm wondering how they position him like this. They must have seen that his neck and his head are angled so far back. I don't know how you couldn't know that there's a very severe deforming um, traumatic injury to the bones here just by the way he's laying in the CAT scanner. That just from a radiologist perspective, looking at that top picture. This is um, a great point, uh, uh, Wendy, because sometimes you'll have a patient with ankylosing spondylitis with an unstable, subtle fracture, but because they're ankylosed at the upper thoracic uh, area or cervical thoracic area, and uh, they'll, if, if you don't bolster or support their head and upper neck, that fracture might uh, open up even yeah. more, causing a spinal cord injury. So yeah. that's why I tell my residents when, when, when they, these patients present, it's like you got to go down with them to the scanner and make sure that the gap between the head and the uh, stretcher or uh, uh, is filled. Like there should be some, some uh, you got to fill that gap. Otherwise, they'll hyperextend more. And, and it's a big lever arm across that fracture. That And I, we had a patient that actually um, uh, deteriorated neurologically during, during a scanner. So that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's a great observation. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great point. I mean, not exactly what you said. I mean, this is actually one of those situations where spine precautions saying that the patient should be flat, like the way we treat almost every trauma case uh, is actually bad, right? You, these patients need to be position the way they live their life. Um, and so th that's what that's part of why these cases are so challenging, especially the, the, the trauma cases. And, and like this case, uh, you know, like I said, he was localizing. Uh, the one thing, uh, you know, in the spirit, Dr. Baj of, of, the, of the guys taking their oral boards, you know, again, for, for everybody, the ABCs, you know, your eyes immediately go to this fracture, but you have to think about, you know, the, the patient's already intubated but you have to think about what those other injuries are. And I think the, the big uh, important take home point is to make sure you look for other fractures because a lot of times they will have not just one fracture. You see that cervical CT and that's where your eyes are drawn, but you have to look at the rest of the neural axis. You have to look at the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine. And then of course, when you see a fracture like this, 
you know, this automatically in my mind, this warrants a CTA. Um, and this patient did have uh, a traumatic dissection. So they got started on, on, on aspirin um, just to make our lives a little bit harder as well. You know, one more comment, get back to the CT. This is something, because I know there are a few radiologists on the conference today as well. That's something, you know, not everybody who comes in has a known history of ankylosing spondylitis. Where I was before a county hospital, you don't know their history. So I always told our residents and fellows, you know, really look carefully and make sure somebody knows that before they get any other treatment, when we get our original CT, except it's an unknown diagnosis. And even the intubating can break them more. So the intubation and the positioning on the scanner, all these things, it's important to really look for these, the findings, subtle or not, you know, this obviously isn't subtle, but um, sometimes nobody knows. So letting the team know ahead of time what they're in for is, is probably a good idea too. That's it. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, they, uh, you know, he got a CTA that showed bilateral uh, vertebral artery dissections. Um, he was started on some antiplatelet medication. Obviously the CT showed the significant uh, C7 and T1 um, extension injury, as well as a T8, T9. Um, the MRI obviously is, is, is pretty poor quality. Um, it actually doesn't show as much hematoma, I guess, as what I would have thought, but um, obviously still an unstable injury. Uh, and then he did get a brain scan that showed a, a few small uh, uh, little restricted uh, diffusion hits from his, from his uh, dissection. Uh, so in terms of uh, the, you know, the panel now, the patient's ours. So you know, how do we want to handle this patient? Um, what would you guys do this all in one sitting? Would you t address both fractures? Would you do the neck first and then, and then bring him back? Um, you guys have any thoughts on kind of how you would manage this? Yeah, I mean, this the timing of this is also important. This patient has uh, bilateral vert dissections with a stroke. So, and you know, he's localizing um, like this. He doesn't, so, so there's no brain injury. It's just the, 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 the strokes are due to the dissection, correct? So there's no additional TBI. Yeah, there's no, not really, no. Yeah, so the timing, you know, no, like, of like this is important. So what do you think, uh, Dr. Baj, um, you have this, you know, it's a challenging case, obviously, but this guy has concurrent bilateral vert dissections and uh, he's on aspirin. Would you wait a little bit and see to, for this to cool off while you're maintaining spinal precautions or you do it immediately? I mean, this is something that is uh, Yeah, that's... Th th this is not an easy one. Uh, way, way to go with, with, the, with the start off with this case, uh, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> you really got us thinking right from the get go. Uh, so it's interesting because, you know, a lot of times when we see these vert injuries, it's, it's, it's usually and luckily, you know, asymptomatic and, and is not associated with a stroke. But here you have an, a brain MRI that confirms diffusion, uh, DWI changes. Is that correct? Yeah, just a few. I mean, it's a few, you know, in, in that in that area where you would expect it. Okay. Nothing, nothing horrific. I mean, nothing like a, a hemispheric stroke. I mean, it doesn't have a brain, you know, but a couple small little hits, which, you know, I think, you know, we said is attributable. So, you know, what I basically said was, you know, obviously this is, you know, top down, you know, we talked to our vascular guys, they said, you know, get him some aspirin, we know it's there, maintain his blood pressure. Um, but my fear is, you know, watching this guy with spine precautions with with as best we can tell a, a uh, working spinal cord and that he deteriorates, right? The nurses turn this guy, yeah. um, you know, so my feeling on this guy was the sooner he gets stabilized, the better. Um, and we basically do every, everything we can to maintain, uh, you know, perfusion otherwise, make sure he doesn't get hypotensive, you know, the, the, the other good stuff. But uh, I, I wanted to stabilize this, um, Kind of as, as as soon as he was stable from a from a trauma standpoint, so his hemothorax was was addressed. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I'll, I'll 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 relinquish the time to my colleagues, but I completely agree with that. I can tell you that uh, it's important to have a conversation with the family. Anytime yeah. an elderly patient has an ang spondy fracture, they have a high perioperative morbidity and mortality. Yeah. That's just a fact. Uh, so they're, they have a high chance of not doing well, whether you intervene or not intervene, but you can't just leave that fracture sitting there on the floor or in the unit. It's just, if you don't take them to the OR pretty soon, you're just not going to take them. So 
I agree. Yeah. I, I would take him back early for uh, a long posterior only construct. Okay. So that's what we did. We, we kind of went and in the same setting, um, I did a, a posterior uh, cervical and uh, uh, then went two up, two down on the, on the, on the fracture. So just uh, a quick point I want to, you know, emphasize, this is definitely one of those cases where you have to be there when they flip. The, the, the flip is the, when you, when you position the patient, that is the most dangerous part of the case, in my opinion. Uh, so I know monitoring is uh, controversial, but this is a case you monitor. You get pre-positioning uh, uh, motors and SSEPs. Uh, if you have something to monitor, great. You turn the patient prone, you reassess. And the most important thing, again, is, is the positioning. And sometimes you have to, uh, with these patients, uh, you know, they have horrific deformity at baseline and then they fracture. This is not the time to do a deformity correction. You have to fuse them in the position that they, that they live. And so that's actually very hard sometimes. A real kyphotic patient, um, they don't fit on a Jackson table too well, right? So you have to, you have to get creative. You have to bolster up the chest pad. You have to sometimes, um, again, get, get creative with how you're going to position this patient. Steve, I, a couple of questions for you as far as how you position this patient. A, would you do a sandwich flip in this patient? You would get them reduced first, just maybe by kind of, you know, not reduction or anything, but just maybe taking that pillow away from their head, getting some x-rays, making sure they're in line. That's one option with the sandwich flip. And the second question is, would you potentially um, consider flipping this patient awake? So that, so this guy was already intubated, uh, okay. so I didn't ha I didn't have to worry about that. But you bring up a good you bring up a good point. I mean, um, uh, we ended up having him in a collar, obviously, uh, and try to maintain as much stability as we possibly could. Well, I had him in a Mayfield. Um, I really built up the chest pad as much as possible uh, because the concern is right. The minute we turn him prone, we're going to make him we're going to just extend him way more. So. Um, the, so we built up the chest pad and then typically, you know, we use the, the, the flat for our D gen and everything else. You use the flat bottom on the Jackson. Well, this is when I use that sling to try to get that feet low, to try to help, help him maintain some of that kyphosis. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. When I trained with Zia at Brown a couple of years ago, there was a few times, even if the patient was intubated, I had never done this during my residency training. We would actually keep the patient, we actually awaken the patient for, for the flip. Um, Ali, I mean, you trained with Zia too. Do, do you ever recall doing that? And curious what your experience is with that. Did, did what now, Michael? Um, despite the fact that the patient would be intubated, we would actually wake the patient up intubated uh, for the flip for highly unstable fractures. Yeah, I, I never did that with him, uh, luckily, but uh, I, I have done that uh, independently. I've done that independently. I don't love to do it. Um, I, I'm, I rely on my IOM and... You know, I was just going to put in the chat box. I don't love the Wilson frame, but sometimes the Wilson frame is the best option for these patients. If you're going to yeah. use a Jackson, I put a lot of pillows. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, a good, that's a good point. Exactly. Along the same line. So uh, the so, you know, I've never tried uh, 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 flipping the patient awake, but definitely the air was secured. You're saying that the breathing tube is in, but you're flipping him away, correct? Because right. these so these this this population is extremely challenging to ventilate. I had a couple of cases where like the peak airway pressures when they're prone because of the kyphosis that ankylosed, it's hard to ventilate. Their peak airway pressures are are high, so definitely you got to secure that breathing tube. And if you want to flip it awake, but the breathing tube should be in. The other time I've done a couple of cases where I've done it in the seated sitting position, just for patients with isolated cervical. Or, uh, or cervical thoracic injuries where they're very ankylosed and you want to, you know, because they're kyphotic. And uh, I thought it was really dangerous to flip them. So I did, a, did them in a, a sitting position, you know, with a, you know, so then, then seated, they become horizontal almost, you know, uh, so yeah. that's, that's also another option. So kind of in the interest of time, I'll kind of move along, but so this is a CT post-op and you can see, I mean, this guy at baseline has bad deformity and we actually were able to reduce that fish mouth a fair amount, it's not perfect. Um, but just, just like Dr. Baj mentioned, I mean, these guys have a rocky post-operative course. This guy, you know, was in the hospital for a while. He ended up 
um, <clears throat> you know, getting a getting a, a trach and a peg tube and everything else uh, with all that soft tissue in the front. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't swallowing and stuff. So, but 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 he's in, you know, he's hanging in there, um, you know, doing okay. So, uh, but anyway, th th again, this was a, a, a kind of an interesting trauma case. I thought that would be uh, would be nice to share. Okay, so moving on, um, or I guess key points, right? So, so as I mentioned, look at the entire neural axis. Uh, many of these patients have more than one unstable fracture. So, you know, make sure you don't make that mistake of having your eyes draw, you know, drawn to that really horrific looking C-spine and then you miss an unstable fracture or sometimes a hairline chance fracture in another segment. Um, and like I mentioned, I think positioning is the most important part of this case. Uh, and do not try to use a short construct. I don't think, uh, you know, if we were to get them reduced, I don't think this is a case where you try to do like a, a single level ACDF. These are massive lever arms. And I think uh, you, should, you should think about using at least two up, two down, uh, sometimes more in order to get this stabilized. So our second case, uh, this is a 70 year old man um, who comes in with uh, neck pain, headaches, uh, on physical exam, uh, he has myelopathy, uh, and he has this MRI. Um, Nader, you want to maybe comment on this or have anybody see what they think about this? Sure thing. I was like responding to, uh, to making comment in the chat box. So uh, we can see uh, this is a uh, patient uh, uh, that has autofusion. Um, and uh, atlas assimilation. So that produces a big le le lever arm at the atlantoaxial joint. So you have two pathologies. The uh, atlas is autofused with the uh, with the occiput. You won't say assimilated because probably that's autofused because of ankylosing spondylitis. And then subaxially, he has a uh, autofusion at multiple segments. So this would create two big lever arms uh, above and below the atlantoaxial joint. And this would make that patient unstable uh, at that joint you can see there's increased ADI because it's it's it's, yeah. it, it, it's a hypermobile joint in addition to that you, there's an element of cranial settling cranial settling so so that's what uh, what I see here and uh, this is a to me a much friendly friendlier case than the previous one and yeah. I look forward to fixing this case as opposed to the previous one yeah. so I would I would <laughs> I would uh, have uh, also Dr. Gibbs uh, comment any other additional you want to something that I missed too on this image. Well, no, it, I would just comment that, you know, it, it's hard to tell this from this one image, but the cord looks okay. And the cord is very uh, small. So, I mean, this has been going on, I think, for a long time. This is nothing acute, right? So he's presenting, it sounds like kind of late in the game with all this stuff, but um, it's been happening a long time. So probably not an emergent case, like you're saying, it's right. something you can kind of take your time and fix. But the good thing is there probably not any cord signal abnormality. You have a little bit of space there at the frame and magnum, um, but yes, if it's moving, obviously that's going to be a problem. He might be digging it every time he moves his head or moves around. Yeah. I think there's also stenosis below the autofusion too, which we don't yeah. want to miss like at what, five, six or four, five. Yeah, it's like so. four, four, five or four, yeah. five. Yeah, four, five. So, yeah, so so that, that was my thought. And again, uh, you know, the way I kind of think about this uh, you know, we, we, you know, we trained with Dr. Manesis. And so we, we uh, as Nader can attest, you know, we got a fair amount of uh, exposure to this problem. And we always kind of break these problems down into, is it a reducible problem or is it an irreducible problem? Uh, and this is definitely one that, that is nice because it, it does tend to move. So this is a reducible uh, issue, but, you know, it does again uh, present some challenges with uh, how, limited his, his mobility is in the rest of the spine because it's very important when you're doing when you're when you're fixing these patients to make sure that their alignment is is, is good right so so what we did was we admitted this man uh, we put him in some traction and there's a CT scan after he was in 15 pounds of traction uh, for about 12 hours and uh, I think to, to your point, Michael, about, you know, doing things awake and kind of fixing them in position. So one of the thing, one of my concerns always with an OC fusion uh, or, or a, a case like this is making sure that their head position is good and they can swallow. 
So we actually, so we put them in crown halo, we reduced them, and then I fixed them in a vest, and uh, and then and then flipped them in the vest to 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 do a uh, occipital cervical fusion. And by having him be in a vest, we could actually have him eat, prove he could swallow, uh, prior to fixing him in that position. Any comments on that? Sure, my experience is that uh, these usually are easily reducible, you know, so always don't jump at a, uh, an anterior approach to resect the odontoid or anything like that, because you can see evidence of instability with an increased ADI. So that means that that, that joint is really mobile and easily can be easily reduced uh, with distraction. So, uh, so, and that's nice. And then, you know, as Dr. Volume mentioned, you fix, you lock them in a halo to test their, uh, their swallowing and make sure they have horizontal vision. And then you do that. <laughs> what are your thoughts about uh, maybe just ending a construct as C1? I, I probably would have done the same thing you did. I'm just curious though. It looks like this is more of a C1-2 problem. I didn't really see what the OC1 joints look like, but what are your thoughts about maybe just ending in C1, sparing him going up to the occiput in a case like this? That's a great point. Um, so in him, he was fused between occiput and C1. So I wasn't losing anything. Um, no, and so you can kind of, it's maybe a little hard to see, but his C1 ring, you can see is pretty much fused to, to his frame and magnum. So I thought it's not, he's not losing anything by doing that. And the fixation is just a little bit better, but you bring up a good point, right? In that isolated case where it's just C1, C2, um, if, if you can, it, that's, that's completely fine to do just a C1, C2. In his case too, I wanted to go across that area where he was a little stenotic uh, down below. So uh, I wanted to bridge across that and just do a little a focal decompression there as well. So I ended up going to C6 um, and then used a, a tolygus rib graft as well for, for, for a fusion. So one quick point here, Steve. Uh, if a patient has a positive SVA, this guy doesn't have much of a positive SVA, but if they do, and sometimes they do when they're ankylosed and they're kyphotic, I would stop at T2 across the junction because uh, uh, of, of potential, and I've seen it, a higher failure rates. So this guy's SVA is low. So so the, the moment uh, at the bottom instrumented level is not not high, but but sometimes if I have a really high SVA, creates a huge moment, bending moment across that bottom level. So I usually got down to the upper thoracic spines, T2, T3, if they have a positive SVA. And oftentimes they do have a positive SVA. Positive means like 10 or like nine centimeters, um, uh, you know, especially those patients with, with uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. What do you think, uh, Dr. Baj, about this? Yeah, I think Nadir, that's that's a, that point is very well taken. I think it's good to understand what their overall alignment is, and uh, you know, it's just the, these are the the patients and and the conditions in which longer is 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 is, more, is safer and and more durable. Um, so I, I I agree. I would cross those junctions and and provide uh, you know more levels of fixation in these cases. Yeah. Uh, so a couple, just again, key points, uh, you know, with any CV case, as, as we mentioned, uh, is, the, is the problem, is it fixed or is it reducible? If it's reducible, uh, preoperative traction is, is, your, is your ally. Uh, and then again, pay attention to the head position. Uh, so this was a patient that presented to me who had an OC fusion and immediately after surgery couldn't swallow. Again, I didn't do the OC fusion, but she presented to me for a second opinion as to why she couldn't swallow. And uh, you can see this lady unfortunately got positioned in like a Chiari, you know, surgery, military tuck uh, position and they, they fixed her head. You can look at the, the, you know, the big space between C1, C2 and the occiput and C1 and until she's flexed. And so, uh, you know, she had, she had to get some kind of a revision uh, by me. So. Pay attention to that, uh, to the alignment, shoot an x-ray um, and make sure that, that the, the endotracheal tube, right, is a nice smooth curve. There's not an acute kink and you're not tucking the chin or these patients are, are gonna be unhappy. Yeah, that's another great point here, Dr. Volune. So if that happens, it can happen, you know, obviously if you pay attention, it won't, but it does. And 
Dr. Bai speaks about the retromandibular space. There are many different ways to make an assessment of um, that head positioning being adequate and appropriate. You know, want to keep them neutral, not hyperextended or hyperflexed. But if you position them and the result ends up like this, don't be shy in taking them back and you know, redoing this like uh, uh, the right way. Should not say, well, you know, peg and trach and that is what it is. You know, you gotta be open to revising them and uh, uh, fixing the problem if you know what it is. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so now deformity. So this is, a, this is a 42 year old guy who comes in with really severe disease. Uh, he presents with years of back pain, neck pain, inability to maintain horizontal gaze. So in his physical exam, he is completely rigid. He has a completely fused OC fusion. He has, a, he has fused hips. Uh, he has no movement essentially uh, in his spine. So he's kind of fixed in this position um, and comes to see me uh, uh, to see you know, what, what we can do for him. You can see he's kind of a bigger guy. You know, these, uh, this is his scout film um, on the CT. His, his scoliosis films just, I mean, really weren't penetrating enough. Um, these are obviously not very flattering, uh, the, the scout films, but you can see he's a bigger guy. He's, he's probably around 250 pounds. Um, and so what do, you guys, what, what do you guys think? What do you do with this? Um, Dr. Selby, what do you think? Or... <laughs> Nadir, I, uh, I would definitely uh, look at his hips first. It's a good test for a guy like this as well. So, yeah, I would, uh, I would seriously uh, get his hips replaced with your uh, friendly orthopod and, uh, and then work up from there. But uh, I think he should do uh, pretty well with initial hip replacement. Then you got to just do realignment and reassess. So we did that. We had them. We had them see him, and uh, you know the order of that. I I think is important, but I don't think I have it quite figured out. So I'd like you know your guys' opinion on that. Um, what we ended up doing was, uh, you know, our ortho guy said, well, his main thing really for him quality wise now is is, is he wants to be able to just look ahead, right? So he wants his neck fixed. Uh, and they wanted us to do that first and then do the hips. Um, so that's what we ended up doing, but, uh, but you bring up a good point and, and I'm not sure, I know that, you know, it, it, it's going to change the cup angles potentially and, and, and your increased risk of, of dislocation if you do a huge correction. And so there's always this kind of back and forth, but I guess I'd like to get everybody's opinion on what they think the right order is there. Yeah, look, I think if there's no deficit, um, I would advocate starting at the base first because you want to get the base sorted out and everything builds off that. So to me, uh, doing the hips first and then reassessing and look, orthopods, they can get around it. I mean, I'm an orthopod by training and there are, you can use a bigger cup. You can, you know, you can uh, basically put in a constrained uh, hip replacement. There are a whole bunch of options. These are often low demand patients. And so I think as long as it's in their mind when they're doing the primary hip arthroplasty, uh, yeah, I think that that's the way to go personally. But I also appreciate that we can probably do the cervicothoracic junction safely here as well. And it might help them for anesthetic reasons when it comes to the hip replacement. So I think that's an argument you can make the other way. But I personally would go bottom up. What do you think? Uh, that's a fantastic point. What do you think, uh, Jonathan? Uh, and then and then Alex. Yeah, I 100% I agree with you, uh, Steve. It's I've never quite really figured it out myself either about what the best uh, order is on this. Um, you know, whether the spine should be done first or the you know the the hips or the knees, whatever the you know whatever other issues are, if they're readily apparent. My my, my general experience is that uh, the, the at least where, where I've wherever I've trained, the ortho people are always willing. They always are pushing to have us the spine sort of do everything first before um, anything else is done. So, I mean, that's just, that's just my experience. I don't, I don't think there's really a right answer to this. Now, so with his, with his hips being fused, right, he had a fair amount of contractures. And so I definitely did not want to do his lumbar spine with his hips still fused, right? Um, so I, I definitely told him, I said, well, I'll do his neck, but you're going to have to do the hips before I do the low back because 
if I do a lumbar PSO on this guy, uh, you know, he's not going to be able to stand. He's not going to be able to do anything um, until, right, the, the hips are done, those are mobilized, and then he does a lot of therapy uh, and works through those, those contractures. Okay, so uh, so we started, um, yeah, so we started in the neck, but just uh, kind of briefly, again, so as the, with AS and, and deformity, so as they uh, progressively get worse, this is typically from lumbar, you know, progressive lumbar kyphosis, uh, this can lead to spinal imbalance, which we know is associated with, with pain and instability. Um, these patients have uh, worsening problems, trying to stand up straight and, and effort with walking. And then the, the, the progressive thoracic and cervical kyphosis results in this problem with maintaining horizontal gaze. Right. We all know about spinal balance. I won't, I won't uh, uh, do too much of this, but uh, basically, again, putting our center of gravity over, over the femoral heads uh, is very little uh, energy expenditure. But as we uh, get further deviated from that normal cone of economy, there's, uh, patients are uh, more disabled. And this is kind of our, just our general, what, what, you know, how we assess this, right? our SVA, uh, the pelvic tilt, um, and then for these, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, cervical thoracic, you want to look at the chin brow angle. Okay, and so in terms of goals of surgery, you know, you, you would like a relatively normal pelvic tilt, uh, an SVA less than five centimeters, and, and that chin brow angle, um, probably you know, ten to twenty degrees. You definitely don't want to overcorrect. Um, patients are much more uh, happy if you undercorrect them, they're still able to go downstairs, and read and, and do those things uh, than to overcorrect. Uh, so, so undercorrection is better than overcorrection here. And then of course, uh, you wanna uh, decompress uh, the spinal cord and the foramen if there's, if there's compression and you want a, a solid fusion. Uh, and then in terms of how we, how we achieve that in, in these cases is typically uh, Closing wedge osteotomies or pedicle subtraction osteotomies. Uh, again, in the lumbar spine, it typically arouse, uh, allows about 30 degrees of correction, uh, but there are, again, risks of uh, derotomy um, and pseudoarthrosis and excessive blood loss with that. Can be done asymmetrically as well. Uh, and so this is um, there's some fluoro shots of uh, a lumbar PSO. We have our um, uh, temporary rod on either side. Uh, we have our, you know, doing our osteotomy with a, uh, with an osteotome. And then how we um, uh, close that up. And so I, I, I find with, with these AS cases, uh, these are sometimes harder to close. Uh, that anterior longitudinal ligament is, is usually pretty, uh, pretty hard to crack. And so it, this, this takes a little bit more effort sometimes uh, than the iatrogenic flat back PSOs. You guys have any comments on that? Uh, Dr. Uh, Mavagani, Alexander, what do you think? Yeah, um, impressive cases um, you're sharing. Thank you for this. Um, there's a Switzerland talking here. Um, I am in ankylosing spondylitis. I think for me, um, the ostomy is easier. I'm just go with the chisel and to the anterior cortex and I crack it under fluoroscopic control. And um, I think the bone quality of the cantulus bone is bad, uh, worse than in degen. Uh, and the uh, cortical, maybe maybe I'm a lucky guy that I, in my experience, it's easier to do an osteotomy. I think one osteotomy is not enough. Uh, perhaps for my, I, I don't see the, the whole spine. I can just, I, I think I would go for two. But my command would be if your orthopedic guys says, um, no, first the spine and then the hips, maybe it's good to look for another opinion. Um, <laughs> I, would not, I would not accept it. I, I agree totally with you not to do the lumbar spine without the hips first. Yeah. Um, and uh, doing, the, do the, doing the neck first uh, in this situation, it makes sense for me. Um, but maybe we have to push the orthopedic guys yeah. to do a bilateral, um, um, <clears throat> and um, it was a great command from uh, Dr. Mana from the chat box, double mobility cup um, in ankylosing spondylitis always 
um, but this is too much auto. Um, uh, but I, I force them. I would refuse to do them. I would say, okay, if you don't do it, I find somebody else. Right. No, no, I, yeah, hundred percent agree. So definitely that, that was necessary before the lumbar, but, but we went ahead and did the, did the cervical. Um, and so we did this sitting, uh, because of his hips and, uh, it's actually a really nice case <laughs> to do sitting because, uh, the blood loss isn't too bad. You know, they have their precordial Dopplers going. It's not too annoying. But uh, actually, you know, the venous drainage is nice. And uh, we have this guy sitting up, you can see, um, and he's a big guy. So, so this was actually, this, you know, I thought this was going to be horrible. It actually wasn't that bad. Steve, so in your experience, uh, you know, doing a PSO, let's say supine, a lumbar PSO or thoracic, and patients with ankylosing well, lumbar PSO, I take back thoracic. Uh, lumbar PSO and a patient with ankylosing spondylitis compared to non-ankylosing spondylitis in terms of blood losses. What, what's your comment on that? Uh, well, I think um, uh, I mean, usually I think the bone bleeds more in AS cases. I feel like, uh, you know, um, you obviously want to work efficiently and get, get the case done. But my feeling is, is just even instrumenting them, you know, putting in pedicle screws, uh, that blood, the, the bone seems to bleed more. Um, so again, uh, blood loss is, is and, and time is our enemy in these surgeries. You want to get them done efficiently. Um, so I, I guess that, that'd be my comment on that. I agree. So uh, that's us putting in our screws. Um, you can see it's actually, you know, not too bad <laughs> ergonomically. Um, and then there's our PSO. Uh, so I used a jointed rod there actually as like a temporary rod. So that allows, and then a domino to my pedicle screw. So that actually allows the spine to extend, um, and be able to compress without translating in the sagittal plane. Um, and so that actually worked out pretty nicely. Uh, and so let's see if this works. We'll try to play the video. So we have our resident goes up, detaches the Mayfield. And uh, I have that temporary rod there. And again, it's, it's functioning, right? The, 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 the mechanism to, to, uh, for the little rod is, is, is open, right? So it can move and swivel, but it doesn't let the spine translate in the sagittal plane. So I'm able to extend the head um, and close, you know, slowly bring it back without it. Uh, and it, it's just sliding inside that domino um, to kind of let that happen safely. So Kind of slowly, you know, checking motors as you go, watching the dura, uh, palpating along the nerve roots, uh, making sure that that's good until, until my nerves can't take it anymore, and then we tighten it up and 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 put some final rods in. So I did not use that uh, type rod as a final rod. Obviously, um, I kept that in place and then rotted the contralateral side and then took that it, it took that side out and put put permanent rods. Okay. Um, well, and that's so a great then, trick. That's a great trick. So you stabilize, so the rod, you have a hinge rod, yeah. you stabilized above and did you stabilize, did you put in the set screws below or you just. Uh... So it's a domino connector mm -hmm. that I left the domino connector loose. Loose. So okay. Can, yeah. So, okay. You still, you still prevent domino. translating this way. Okay. Got it. And it can, it can, you can extend, but what it, what it prevents is that, that translation. And so that actually worked, worked pretty nice. So um, we did this, uh, we let him recover and then COVID hit. So uh, then he didn't, you know, he was sitting around playing video games um, and then he got his hips done by our ortho guys. We let him recover from that. And then uh, we brought him back and did his, uh, his lumbar spine. So that actually wasn't that long ago. So I don't have, I apologize. The film isn't, isn't great, but you know, overall, again, not, not perfect, but, but better. 
Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how he does. So he got, you know, the C7 PSL, and then I did the, uh, the L4 PSL, and then he got his, his hip fixed. That's an awesome case, man. Okay, um, so I can go through this, or we can do one more. I can do one more deformity case if you guys want. Um, so again, is there any like is there any evidence uh, that you know spinal realignment improves patient outcomes in, in ankylosing spondylitis? Uh, so there's a, a, a couple papers out of um, South Korea. They looked at 45 consecutive patients with uh, kyphotic deformity. They look at they looked at uh, radiographic outcomes and they looked at uh, clinical outcomes using this AIMS score. It basically scored zero to four, zero worse, four markedly improved. Um, and they showed that, that radiographically, these patients improved, their SVA improved, their lumbar lordosis. Um, and then uh, they also had uh, significant improvement in their, in their functional um, uh, outcomes as well. Uh, and then a second paper, uh, 24 patients, and they looked at SF36, uh, the um, <coughs> BATH uh, ankylosing spondylitis disease uh, activity index um, as well as radiographic outcomes. And again, they similarly showed that, uh, you know, these patients do improve. So, you know, these big crazy surgeries, they're, they're, they, we are helping people. They, they do seem to improve. Okay, I'll just quickly kind of go through the last case and then I guess questions and comments. So uh, this is a 55 year old man um, with, with known history of ankylosing spondylitis. Again, presents with inability to maintain horizontal gaze. Um, Again, his, his physical exam, he um, has a rigid spine, normal neurological um, exam. There's his lateral and his AP uh, radiographs. Uh, and that's kind of his CT. Um, so any comments here on how would you guys approach this guy? Um, what, what, what would you end up doing for him? Okay, uh, let's circle back to Dr. Baj. What do you think? Wow, these are great cases. <laughs> like, give, give me a chip shot, jeez. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are challenging, but but that's the thing. Just like Steve, you showed in that previous case, I mean, there, there are no shortcuts in these cases. You're either going to commit to doing a, a very, very large operation, possibly, you know, multi-stages, or, or, or you're not going to do anything. Um, so I apologize. I missed the earlier part. Neurologically, he's, he's intact. Yeah, this is a structural yes. deformity. Correct. Okay. And on his, I see a scout there, uh, on, on the standing scoli fix, what, what is on the scoli films? What is lumbar? What does his lumbar curvature look like? Does he have a flat back? Oh, yeah. You know, he, he, he does have a, uh, actually, he does have a flat back. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell, but he is, you know, he's retroverting his pelvis. His pelvic tilts a, a little bit higher. So I do think, you know, he, he had a fair amount of mismatch, but it's the, the, my challenge with this case is this big sweeping thoracic curve, right? His, his, it's, it's a little hard to do, you know, this, this, this actually doesn't really do it justice, but essentially his T2 end plate is vertical. Right, um, and so where what what do you do with this? Where do you make an osteotomy? I guess is is the question. Uh, um, and you know, yeah, that's 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 exactly right. I mean, that with that high of a, of a T one slope, you know, I I, I think you're bat, you really are obligated to probably do what you did in the last case, which are you know two PSOs. I was thinking maybe at the inflection point in the kind of in the thoracic apex, if you do one VCR, that may work. Um, I worry about the translation there. Uh, you know, th this is a tough one, but he may be getting a, a two, either two PSOs or a VCR in the thoracic spine, honestly. Yeah. So, so we, we ended up doing kind of what you said. So we did two, two PSOs this case. Uh, I did the PSO lower down. I think I did a T2 PSO in this case. Um, his bone quality wasn't really good. So getting that, getting that pedicle screw above my PSO, um, it's a little bit more work. Um, you know, you have to take the, you do a rib resection uh, as well. 
Um, and then we ended up doing a lumbar PS again, staged, but down the road did a lumbar PSO for him. Uh, but again, alluding to, you know, the positioning sometimes, this is what that guy looked like uh, positioned in the OR, all right? This is horrific. I mean, you can't, you can't really do any better than this. This is the, the bed is maxed out uh, in terms of the position and, it, you know, obviously try to get the head up above the heart so you don't have all, you know, all kinds of other complications. But this is sometimes, you know, what you're faced with. Um, and we ended up doing, you know, I don't typically use um, Lamy rolls or, or gel, gel rolls, but, you know, in this case, just to get that extra bit of reverse John Dellenberg, this is what we ended up doing for this case. Uh, and then there's our, our resident. He's, a, he's actually a fellow uh, in vascular, but here he is uh, taking a crack at freehanding some, some, some thoracic pedicle screws. Uh, and then there's our, our post-op result. So when it was all said and done, um, having his T2 PSO, and then we brought him back for a lumbar PSO. And he's, um, he's I think, two years out now. He's doing, doing pretty well. So any, any comments on this? Kudos to this work. Very challenging, um, uh, difficult. What level did you do your other PSO at, did you say? Uh, I think I did L, maybe L2. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> yeah, L2. Whatever you did, it works great. Looks awesome. Yeah, what you. I really like is that you combined and you made one long construct without um, uh, a thoracic part, without a rod, because in the history of um, ankylosing spondylitis can be a progressive kyphosis. And then you have got a good correction in the cervical, you have a PSO in the lumbar spine, and then unfortunately, years later, the thoracic kyphosis gets worse. And then <laughs> you are in the unlucky situation, and so I recommend always combine, make a long construct without any gaps. Uh, so uh, there's no secondary kyphosis in the, un, um, uh, in, the, in the missing in the gap. I like this, uh, very beautiful. Thank you. What's your time interval between the two PSOs? Uh, I think it was about six months. Yeah, I'll let them set, settle down and um, I think it was about that. I, I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, you know, probably, you, you know, there's, there's probably a sweet spot. I think if you do it too early, I worry about, you know, complications, DVTs and, and, and things like that still kind of maybe being in that, you know, post-surgical state if you do it too soon. And I think if you, if you wait too long, uh, at least for me, they may not come back. Right. I mean, my patient population, they may, they may go seek uh, treatment somewhere else. So um, anyway, I did about six months for this guy. You can see, I mean, his coronally, his head still off to the side a little bit, but better is, uh, is, is I'm okay with better. I don't think perfect was in the cards for this guy. Um, so anyway, that's what, that's what we achieved. Steve, uh, do you use navigation for these cases? Uh, I, I don't usually. No, I, I typically freehand everything. Um, I will uh, uh, will shoot an O-arm uh, if, uh, if I'm concerned about, about anything and shoot x-rays. I do stimulate my pedicle screws uh, as well uh, if, if I'm at all worried about it. Um, but, you know, it, sometimes it's just not practical. The navigation... Uh, is 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 not perfect either. I you know in that sitting case, uh, there was no way right. There was no way we we're even going to get a fluoro machine that high. There wasn't a way you were going to get an O arm spin. Um, I mean this this bed doesn't really allow you to shoot much of an O arm right. So I think this is one of these cases where um, I think I think uh, it's it's better to just you know be comfortable with the anatomy, be able to to to, to put the pedicle screws and uh, you know trust trust your ball tip feeler. Okay, so briefly just to wrap up, we have a couple minutes. 
So again, the, the, a, the AS patients present spine surgeons. Uh, most frequently for everybody, it's gonna be related to those spine fractures that, you know, that horrific first case I showed. Um, CVJ instability, um, as well as deformity. Uh, take home point, you know, the patient positioning is key. And, and, and it's, this is, you have to think outside the box sometimes. This is not your typical DGEN case. This is not something where you just, everybody goes on a Jackson table um, you, you have to sometimes get creative uh, with how you, how you manage these patients and how you position them safely. Um, and then uh, finally, again, with, with the spinal deformity cases, right, they're challenging, but they're also very rewarding. We know that uh, it impacts quality of life uh, and there's growing uh, evidence that these, these, these alignment, realignment operations are, are, are worth it for the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. That was beautiful. Um, any other comments uh, from our uh, panelists and uh, co-hosts? What's your learning curve for these kinds of cases as far as getting comfortable doing these without maybe like another attending partner, just doing them with a resident or a fellow? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to always... Uh, I think you have to always feel safe, um, and I think if you're if you're in a practice and you have a senior partner, this is a this is a time to to grab them um, and to ask for help. I don't think it, you know we should we should always be willing to ask for help, um, but at the same time, you know, uh, I think you should be confident in your skills. I mean, if uh, if you feel like you're the best guy to take care of it, then you should take care of it. I mean, this isn't something you should ship on to someone else. Um, if, if you know you have the skill set. And I think uh, breaking down these problems uh, into small pieces and thinking through it uh, sequentially, um, I think these are, right, these, you're, it's definitely doable. Um, and they're, they're challenging and there are complications that occur, but um, I, I, I think it's something that, that uh, you know, we all should be able to, to do. Absolutely beautiful comment. I agree. You got to break it down and plan. It's all, all about planning. Uh, Dr. Selby spoke about that before. It's always in Dr. Rasuli. It's always a recurrent theme. Dr. Bosch, Dr. Gibbs, always like you got to plan it ahead and rehearse, rehash the steps uh, 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 leading to the operating room. Definitely asking for help uh, is a uh, low threshold for these cases. You know, two experienced surgeons better than one. You know, it's always like we, we know that. Now, um, who is, so for, for next week's um, uh, presentation, do you know uh, Dr. Baj or who's, who, who's, who, who's the next presenter who's going to host? I think it's me. I believe it's me. So I'm going to be the host next week, and we are going to have our own Dr. Alexander Mamagani presenting, I think, complications. Is that right? Everybody's favorite topic. Everybody loves it when they're not theirs. So they love to watch somebody else's complications. So all of our hosts and panelists can contribute. And is that it? Dr. Mamagani, Alex, is that correct? Is he there? Did he go? Alex, I, no, I, I thought you were going to do, uh, I thought he you were going to do. He ran away. Maybe it's the time. I will, I will speak here. <laughs> Great. Complications Great. version four. That's awesome. Um, we're looking Great topic. forward to it. Great topic. Sounds good. I'll yeah. learn something. Thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Volune. It's been a fantastic uh, talk, and uh, we're definitely going to invite you um, again to Virtual Global Spine. Everyone have a great evening. I appreciate it. It was my honor. Thank, thank you so much.